Well, good evening. We want to welcome you to our Bible study for tonight. We are going to take a look at the gospel lesson from Sunday. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us today as we open up your word, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This was the sermon I intended to do on Sunday. We are going to go verse by verse at the gospel lesson for today. But again, I am just really struggling, as most of us Christians are in this country, about how we are to respond to the events of these days. And it does seem like many Christians have taken, <clears throat> you know, not an either or option. Either you're on my side or you're wrong and evil and sinful. And in particular, we're talking about whether it be the abortion debate or who we vote for and so forth. And and I, I just don't see Jesus in this debate right now, not in the way the politics of this country is working and a lot of my evidence for this is based upon this, that Jesus did not come to transform the political systems of the world, that the church of Jesus Christ is always better as a, as a, a, a protest to the values of the world. We are a protest to the values of the world. When we become the status quo, when we become the values of the world, we are ripe with corruption and destruction and evil. The church of Jesus Christ has done evil in the name of Jesus Christ whenever it becomes the predominant culture throughout all the medieval times. We were an evil when we became the predominant culture. So we need to be careful about becoming the predominant culture. We push people away from Jesus Christ. The early church was not the predominant culture. It stood as a sign of protest against the values of the world. And I believe that this is, we have, we have, by trying to be the values of this country, whether you're a right-wing Christian or a left-wing Christian, we, again, make a mockery of Jesus Christ. We destroy our witness to Jesus Christ. We need to witness in a better way. Now, when I say we are protest, protest the values, guess what? That begins and ends with this word. Now, see, I know you're saying protest. Yeah, let's go and protest, baby. Let's go march on Washington. Let's go take our AK-47s and threaten the governors of our countries. No. You got a gun in your hand, you do not represent Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not against you having a gun. But when you use a gun to protest, you certainly do not represent Jesus. Oh, let me say that again. When you have a gun in hand and go to protest, you most certainly do not represent Jesus Christ, cannot represent Jesus Christ, will not ever represent Jesus Christ. You do damage to Jesus because this is what we represent. This is the protest that we make to the world. We protest the values of the world with the love of God. Love is always in protest the to, to the totalistic schemes of right-wing and left-wingers of every country on the planet. Yes, you all are totalistic. I'm getting as political as I like to get with this type of stuff, because I am certainly not on either one of your sides. If you believe that you represent Jesus Christ as a right-wing Christian or a left-wing Christian, Jesus isn't in there. Jesus isn't in there. Jesus is in our protest to the values of the world with the good news of love. Ooh, I got you going. I got me going. I'm going to prove this to you. We're going to take a look at our lesson for today. Mission possible. So I hope you will download the handout. It's just a verse by verse thing. And we're going to look at it just as we have it broken apart verse by verse. So after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them. This is, this is in addition to like the 12. So remember, Jesus had the 12, but he had a larger group of disciples, 72. And he said, well, two by two, two by two, why, 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 two by two, okay, why? Um, because 
two people, first of all, two people, well, you always have one other person to back you up and support you in your time of need, but also there is a biblical uh, verse that talks about uh, that, that, uh, that the truth is established by the witness of two, okay, or wherever two or more are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them, Jesus says. So two is a really important number that two of us represent a plurality that, that, represent, that can represent Christ and we can take care of each other. So he sent them out two by two uh, ahead of him to every town and every place he's about to go. Again, 72 disciples. Luke is the only gospel, by the way, if you're looking at the handout, the only gospel account that mentions this story. And so there was something significant about this. As we mentioned, he had more than 12 disciples. We go on, verse 2. Jesus told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Um, this indicates the urgency of what was taking place. Now, Jesus' urgency was different than maybe his disciples. His disciples honestly thought they'd have Jesus around for another 20, 30 years. Okay? Jesus knew that he was around for another year, maybe, before the crucifixion. And he had to make sure that this message started getting out and that his disciples started being a part of the process of getting the word out. That they had some training to do this. The world, because you see, whether it's indifferent or malevolent towards Jesus Christ and the message, is ultimately unconcerned about the mission that we have. And I'm telling you this, this is one reason why, no, I'm going to this politics thing. No politics in any country, anywhere, not the United States of America, represents Jesus Christ. There are no politics that represent Jesus. None. Zero. Okay? We, in the United States of America, according to Thomas Jefferson, not Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison, pardon me, he was a guy who would know, said that this country is not a Christian nation. We are a secular nation of religious people. Politics do not represent Jesus Christ ever, under any circumstances, ever. Why are we getting so angry at each other? Your politics don't represent Jesus. And Jesus should be the passion of our life. Not the dang political system of this country. <sighs> I know, I'm taking out my rage today. I apologize. Kind of not. There's an urgency to the message of Jesus Christ. It's not about politics. There are the harvest is out there before it spoils while the iron is hot, let's go out. Okay, now I'm mixing my metaphors, right? There's an opportunity. The harvest needs to be taken in. You know, when the corn comes in, if you wait too long, it ugh, becomes really starchy and awful. And nobody wants to eat that. Take it while the fruit is still sweet. It's still good. You want to grab it. Jesus goes on. Go, I'm sending you like lambs amongst wolves. Okay, you are lambs amongst wolves. That indicates, again, that the world as I mentioned to you, is unconcerned, and the disciples must depend upon the provision of God to protect them. Not guns! Again, I don't care whether you have a gun. I'm not preaching to you a particular political ism or ideology. I don't care about your ideology. But as Christians... Guns do not represent Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 4. Do not take a purse, nor bag, or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. This is kind of an odd verse. <laughs> do not take provisions. Okay, we get that. Because you're going to depend upon the generosity of others. But boy, that's really disconcerting, isn't it? Disciples are not to be troubled with materialistic concerns. Because these, again, are only secondary, maybe even tertiary in nature. Remember, what's the important thing they're bringing with them? They're bringing the love of Jesus to the world. 
this is what they are supposed to carry, not this. Okay? Which again is evidence why any preacher talking to you about materialistic blessing is not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you're hearing a preacher preaching about your materialistic blessing, how you're going to get your materialistic blessing in and be blessed with a financial blessing, they're, they're not preaching Jesus. Health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine. It's not of Jesus. Okay? Do not take provisions. Don't be concerned about these things. Don't bring even money. Not even to change your clothes. Well, okay. Can I bring a pair of underwear? I don't know. And he says, don't greet anyone. That seems pretty rude, doesn't it? Don't greet anyone along the way. Okay, well, this doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean the disciples are supposed to be impolite. You know, because when you're going across the road, for one of the great things I love about culture and about society is that when we pass somebody in a civilized culture, what do we do? We nod at them, we smile at them, we wave at them, we tip our hat. We've kind of lost that in recent days. But what those social niceties indicate is that you're safe with me. You're okay with me. I have no intention to harm you. These are really important social cues that somehow we've lost. We need to, we need to, we need to do that. Okay, let's reinstitute that. So when you see people smile at them, nod at them, say hello. It might be the only hello that that person gets all day and it might actually save that person's life, by the way. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. You're allowed to be polite to people, but when he says, let me read it to you again, do not take a person's sandals, do not, do not greet anyone on the road. He's not saying be impolite. <clears throat> it's an idiomatic phrase that's equivalent to do not dally with them. So in other words, you're on the road and somebody says, hey, hey, how you doing? Hey, do you want to come and eat lunch with me? No, sorry, that's very kind of you, but I've got a place to be. Blessings to you. Okay? That's what that means. Don't dally along the way. You see a friend who's coming the other direction? Hey, why don't you come and sleep tonight here in my tent and we'll have a nice festival feast? Nope, i got to keep going. So again, it's not about the pleasantries of life. It means that don't dally. There's an urgency to what they're doing. Then he goes on, verse 5. When you enter into a house, first say, peace to this house. You bring peace. If someone promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Just very, just won't. I mean, and that's true. You can bring peace. If a person accepts it, they accept it. If they don't, they don't. What can you do? The person who doesn't accept it is going to continue to create violence. You know, this is, this is true in our country right now, okay? I, I've had Christians say, what am I supposed to do? Those other people don't want to hear it. Well, you know what? If you bring the love of God and peace... Many of them will, whatever you think the other side is. See how coy I'm being here? Which side am I on? Which side am I on? I'm on neither side. Because neither side is on Jesus' side. Okay? Neither side. Um, you offer peace. You offer Jesus. They don't accept it. There's nothing you can do but you still offer it, okay? You still offer it. Some will con choose to continue living in the chaos, and there are always people like that. But I will be frank with you, I believe that most people don't want to live in that type of chaos. We're being led around by our noses by two extremists, two totalistic fascist groups, the right wing and the left wing. Oh, man, I'm getting so political here. But yeah, I'm sorry. The leaders of the left wing, leaders of the right wing are both fascists who want to impose their will upon the entirety of the country and not willing to listen to the other side. And this is not of Jesus. So if you're aligning yourself with one of those parties, there's no way you can represent Jesus Christ. Not as a fascist left winger, or not as a fascist right winger. We've got to represent something brand new. Something that brings the peace and love of God as our priority. Wow. Didn't know this was going to come out this way today. I might lose some of y'all. 
we are to offer peace. Verse 7, stay there when you get there, eat, drink, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Now, this is kind of an interesting statement about eating whatever's placed in front of you. You have to understand, they were going into some Gentile neighborhoods. What happens if some pork is put in front of you? Remember, Jews don't eat pork. Now, we have a few years down the road where Peter gets a vision about how there is no such thing as unclean food and that we are to welcome the Gentiles and they are welcome to live their lifestyle and there's no longer anything impure like the Old Testament says. But this prior to that, Jesus is saying, hey, you go into Gentile neighborhood, they offer you something that you would normally be repulsed at. Don't you dare wrinkle your nose at that. Be polite and take it. Okay? That's amazing. Um, once a minute, so once you get to this place, whatever that location is, uh, you stay there until it's completed. You're not to hang around and socialize in other people's homes of the neighbors. Once again, it's a reminder of the urgency of it. And also again, verse 8 about eating whatever, whatever they're at, whatever's set in front of them. Uh, be gracious guests. Because again, they'd be traveling to these Gentile neighborhoods and offer food that isn't kosher for them or biblical. But the mission success is more important than ritual purity. Just hold your nose, be polite, and understand the purpose of this mission is what? The love of Jesus. Not imposing your particular ideologies on other people offering Jesus. You get the difference? Not imposing my ideologies, but offering Jesus. This is the difference of what happened in the politics of our country. We're pushing ourselves on you instead of just offering Jesus to you. If you don't see us offering Jesus, then we're on the wrong side. Heal the sick, verse 9. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near. Healing is a sign of God's kingdom. Remember, that's what Jesus came to do. The <laughs> very, very opening of the gospel. He just come to heal the sick, feed the poor, clothe the naked. These are primary concerns, not secondary concerns. This is the way the gospel of Jesus Christ is made known. When we feed the poor, when we clothe the naked, when we heal the sick, this should be the primary purpose of the church. This is how Jesus is made known. But you, when you enter into a town, you're not welcome there. Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town I wipe off from my feet as a warning. Be sure of this. The kingdom has come near. They are not Remember, if you remember, if you were watching with us last week, the Bible study where we talked about uh, um, the disciples, with the, when they met the Samaritans who rejected Jesus, they wanted to rain down fire upon them to destroy them. Jesus says, don't, don't be uncool, man. Don't do that. Every time you knock on a door, and even if that door is closed in your face, it's an opportunity. And it's just the first knock. You don't rain destruction on people who disagree or turn their backs on the message. No. They're not to call down destruction on those who reject them. Rather, they're just to warn them that God has visited with them today. Because after all, God often comes in very lowly forms. So don't reject the message just on the account of the messenger or the form in which it is brought to us. Because ultimately, the disciple of Jesus Christ represents God. I will tell you, I have seen some very disagreeable people who've had the most wonderful wisdom to share. In my bigotries, because of how they're dressed, or how they smelled, or how they looked. Now, these things don't prevent a person from being used by God. Go to verse 17. The 72 came back, and it was a successful mission. They returned with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us. Their mission was a great success. See, we're thinking, you know, we're thinking, here's what we think. 
coming back to our politics today, we want to impose our position on everybody else. What we are supposed to be doing is just bringing Jesus' love to everybody else. Just offering love. Just bring the love of Jesus Christ. Some are going to reject it, sure. But notice what happened with the disciples. They had an overwhelming success. I'm sure they had rejections along the way. But most people are just hungry to hear something different. What did I say right at the beginning of our lesson for today? That Christians are to be what? We are counter-cultural. Well, I didn't say that. What I did say, but that is true. But we are a protest for, against the values of the world. What is a protest? This is a protest to the values of this world because the world doesn't run by love. But we are supposed to bring God's love into it. People are hungry. They are tired of the power, the politics, the control, the manipulation. They need to hear about Jesus. The Church of Christ needs to do something different than what we've been doing. We're not here to change the politics of the country. We're here to bring the love of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. God is relentless, by the way. And Satan cannot withstand the good news. Satan is a protest to this. We are a protest of the values of Satan in this world. We bring Jesus and nothing can stand against the buzzsaw of the love of God. No guns can stand against that. Oh, yeah, they can bring them out and they can kill you. But the love of God is just relentless. It continues to go on. Guns have not stopped the love of God from being sown in this world. We will continue to do so, regardless of the threat of violence, because this is the way of Jesus Christ. I mentioned on Sunday a story that I encourage you to watch this this uh, um, this movie. It's a documentary called My Italian Secret, and I can tell you for a fact it's on Peacock right now. And anybody who is an Xfinity subscriber in the Pittsburgh area, you get Peacock for free. You can watch that video for free. I don't know if it's anywhere else. But uh, Peacock, or I'm sorry, uh, my Italian secret about the Italians who in World War II protected the lives of 80%. They were able to save 80% of the Jews who lived in Italy. Now we think of Germany again as the, 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 the anti-Semitism and, and, and so forth. Um, <laughs> El Duce, their leader... Okay, in Italy, agreed to the values of Adolf Hitler and created these purity laws. The, their, their, their Congress passed these purity laws that Jews were not welcome in their society and ultimately they were to be hunted down and sent to Germany for execution. 80% of the Jews in Italy survived. Why? Because the Italians said, This is stupid. This is not Jesus. Seriously, this is how they said this. This is not Jesus. Jesus loves them. We are all God's people. They're just people. And so we must protect people. Taking and killing people is wrong. And so communities would band together at great risk to their lives to protect these people. The Jews without wanting any credit for it. They just did it because it was the right thing to do. Guns. Nazi Germany itself could not come up against the love of God. Imagine if the German said, Christians had done that to the same extent. There were German Christians, by the way, who did stand up. But not many. The Italians, most Italians, stood up against the fascism and against the evils represented by Nazi Germany 
even though they are ruled by a, a fascist. They said, no! And the love of God prevailed against guns, against the military might of Nazi Germany. They protected 80% of the Jews who lived in their country. Isn't that spectacular? I just, I just find that amazing. This is what the love of Jesus can do. Like I said, they all were doing it because they loved Jesus. It was the priests. It was the nuns. It was common citizens, good Roman Catholic people who said, No! That doesn't represent Jesus. Because Jesus protects life. How amazing is that? Fantastic. The church is so much better when we represent the love of Jesus Christ. We can do amazing things, especially when it's countercultural and there's a protest against the values of the world. The values of, of Italy were fascist and anti Jew. And the church stood up in protest because that is not our values. Wow, great. Verse 19, I've given authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. No, he's not talking literalistically. I know you know there's a, some fundamentalistic church that actually takes out poisonous snakes and you have to dance around them and be bitten by them and, and survive. Otherwise, you don't have enough faith. This is not. That's dumb. Stupid. Jesus is not talking literalistically here. What he's saying is that the 72 protected were protected from the wiles of Satan. They could not ever be taken out of his hands. He's not talking materialistically here. You could die. People protecting the Jews in Italy did die. There was a really uh, beloved general who gave his life protecting the Jews. They wanted to know where this network was and who was doing it. He, <laughs> he, he uh, told one of the men, Bertoli, who was a, a famous... Uh, Bicyclist. He said, I don't know if I can survive. No, I'm sorry. He told one of the doctors, he said, I'm not sure I can survive the torture. Please make sure you clear everybody out of your safe houses because I don't want to give them up uh, in my weakness. Now, <laughs> the man, you talk about the spirit. This man knew he was a weak man, that he would not be able to withstand the torture of the Germans and the fascists, but he did. He protected the Jews amidst horrendous torture. Some incredible, heroic things that people can do when they have the love of Jesus Christ in their life. Good golly. So you might die. He's not talking about literalistic, materialistic things, but even when you die, you will still be in God's hands. How do we know that this is what he's saying? Because take a look at verse 20. Do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's what's important. Not that you get credit, but we have a transcendent hope. Not that we're going to survive this world. We might die in service to this. Certainly, many of the Italians did. But... Our hope is not in these materialistic blessings of this world. God has a bigger purpose for us. And it's just such a privilege that we have been chosen to represent this. So I'm asking you to live for this. To be countercultural, living your values in protest to the political systems of this world, to the uh, uh, to all of the systems of this world because there is no system, no political system, not the right-wingers, not the left-wingers who represent Jesus Christ. If you are a right-winger, you need to stand and protest to your people in the right wing and represent the love of Christ. When they say, hey, we're going to go take our guns down and take over the Capitol, you're going to say, no, because that's not of Jesus. That's not Jesus' thing. And i got to represent Jesus. Okay? you got your left-wingers saying, we're going to go burn some buildings down. No. No, we're not. 
because I'm standing in protest to your values. I'm supposed to represent the love of Jesus Christ. We need to change a transformation in our hearts. We need to represent Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I have no clue whether anybody's going to get to this point in this lesson today. I just don't. There are times I feel very out of step because I just hear my brothers and sisters in Christ have just sold their souls, it seems to me, to the right wing or to the left wing political systems of this country. They just don't represent Jesus. We need to represent you. We need to represent the love of God. Amidst the chaos of these systems that we've set up in this world. Help us do better, God. Let us represent your love. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Should you be offended by anything I've said today, I encourage you to call me. Give me the respect of love. To care for me enough in your relationship with me to, to talk to me. We can talk about these things, okay? We need to meet each other with the love of Christ. Go in peace. Amen.